Okay. Uh, so good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. So I'm uh, Silvia Boccato, and first I would like to thank Gerald for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, at this series of talks. Um, at the moment, uh, I am um, a postdoc at Sorbonne University, uh, but actually most of this work, uh, the work I will uh, present today, was performed during my PhD thesis at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, which is uh, in Grenoble. So today I will talk to you about phase diagrams and uh, liquid compressibility uh, and how it is possible to uh, get this information with uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy um, at high pressure. So but why are we interested in phase diagrams and uh, liquid compressibility? Uh, so last, um, in the last uh, century, uh, we, in, in the sense of humankind, we uh, tried to dig a hole into the earth and for 20 years, the depth we could reach was only 12 uh, kilometers from the surface, um, which is uh, like less than 0.2% of the Earth radius. And with this, uh, it's quite clear that uh, um, probing a planet like Earth uh, directly is not possible. And for this reason, we're left with other methods, just such as uh, seismology, or uh, we have to study the materials uh, for composing the planet uh, at the high pressure and high temperature conditions. Um, we know that uh, uh, rocky planets, uh, including the Earth, are actually composed of iron alloy with um, light elements. So if we manage to study these materials at high pressure and temperatures, we can get insights on the interior of planets. Um, but why the phase diagram? Uh, so if, uh, and specifically, uh, why the melting curve? So if we manage to measure the melting curve of the composing materials of a, of a core, and then if we know the properties, if we can determine the properties of the liquid, we can, for example, uh, determine the uh, crystallization regime of uh, a planetary core. But there is not only a geophysical interest in this work, but also a fundamental interest, uh, such as is XAS a suitable technique to determine melting and why? And this was actually, the, the question here was raised um, a few years ago uh, when this paper came out where they measured the, the melting curve of iron with XAS and they found a discrepancy with, re with respect to a previous literature um, melting curve determined with uh, X-ray diffraction. Uh, so we will try to address uh, this question. Uh, another question we, we want to address is, uh, is uh, related to this other paper um, who came out uh, in, um, in 2005, uh, where they claim that the number of d electrons for the 3D metals actually affects the slope of the melting curve. Um, then finally, uh, if we can, uh, the question is if we can use uh, excess to determine the interatomic distances in liquids under pressure, because this is something that at these conditions was, uh, was never done before. Um, so this is the outline of uh, the presentation. I will start with the possibilities for um, XAS at high pressure, and then I will focus on the experimental methods uh, we used for this work. Um, I will present you three different results, one related to melting curves determination, then I will make a break, uh, then I, I will talk about uh, composition determination with the uh, um, again under pressure, uh, after this will be the second break, and finally I will talk to you about the compressibility of uh, liquids. So the first part before the first break will be, will be the longest. Okay. Um, in, this slide, in this slide, I want to summarize the different high pressure techniques that are actually coupled to uh, XAS. Um, and here I'm showing a non comprehensive list of places where high pressure uh, can be done with the XAS with some, um, with some references. Okay, so if we're interested in the low pressures, uh, we actually can reach it with the Paris Paris Edinburgh presses or uh, high pressure vessels. If we're interested in a medium, uh, medium range of pressures, then we can use a diamond and cell coupled with resistive heating for the lower temperatures or uh, laser heating with higher temperatures. Then if we're interested in higher pressure and temperatures, we, we can use a dynamic compression. 
actually the phase diagrams of the materials uh, um, we studied in, uh, in this work um, are uh, everything happens in this uh, pressure temperature range and that's why uh, we use the laser heating duct. Um, so to perform uh, these kind of experiments we need to couple three state-of-the-art uh, techniques. Uh, we, we obtain the high pressure with diamond and cell, uh, the high temperature um, heating with uh, lasers, so with the laser heating system, and we probe, we, we have the diagnostic method, um, so we use a synchrotron and the technique uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Mm, and it's important to say that up to now, the only place where it is possible to couple the three techniques uh, now is uh, the beam line ID24 at the ESRF. Um, okay, about the uh, extras. What happens to what happens when um, an X-ray pinches on the sample? Uh, so a photoelectron is uh, generated, and this photoelectron propagates in the sample and scatters against the first uh, neighbors. And it is the interference between the outgoing and the incoming wave that gives uh, the, um, the the oscillations typical of the x sub signal. Then if we look closer to the edge, we have the exchange region. Uh, in this work, uh, for different re to, do, to find different results, we actually used both uh, the regions of the uh, XAS uh, signal. Uh, the experiments were performed on the ID24 beamline at the SRF, which is an energy dispersive beamline. Um, and in the energy dispersive geometry, the pink beam uh, coming from the synchrotron is dispersed by a polychromator crystal and at the same time focused on the sample position. And then the transmitted light is uh, measured on a position sensitive uh, detector. And with the energy dispersive geometry, uh, we're actually able to perform time resolved uh, measurements. So we get one spectrum, a uh, full spectrum at once. Um, and the size of the beam was about uh, 5 by 5 uh, microns, which is compatible uh, with the high pressure technique. Um, so the high pressure uh, technique we used is uh, diamond and cell. Um, so we, we have uh, two diamonds, which are squeezed one against the other, uh, thanks to the, um, the, um, the formation of a membrane, which is filled uh, with, uh, with the gas. Um, and the hardness and the small surface where uh, uh, the hardness of the diamond and the small surface where the force is applied. So it's, uh, this can be um, between uh, like 150 microns to 400 microns, allows us to uh, reach a high pressure, which is typically in the order in between, uh, normally we do in between 10 GPA and 130 GPA. Um, for um, such uh, experiments, uh, it is better not to use uh, monocrystalline diamonds because they can give uh, bright peaks uh, that pollute uh, the, the XAS spectrum. But we actually used uh, nanopolycrystalline diamonds. They're, they're yellow but still transparent. Uh, and they, they were provided by uh, Irifune from uh, Ehime University. So this is how a sample loading looks like. We have uh, uh, the sample embedded in the top view. Um, the sample is embedded in uh, the pressure transmitting medium, uh, here KCL, which also acts uh, as a thermal insulator. Uh, in the sample chamber, together with uh, the sample, we also load a small uh, ruby crystal, um, whose fluorescence as a function of pressure is uh, known. So this is our gauge, uh, the ruby is our gauge of uh, pressure. Uh, the high pressure cell is then uh, placed into the laser heating system. Mm, it's uh, here, uh, where not only we can heat with lasers, but um, since it is equipped with a green laser, we can also at the same, in the same place uh, measure also uh, the fluorescence of, uh, of the ruby, so measure the pressure. But how does a um, uh, measurement uh, work? Okay, so first um, we switch on the laser, the two lasers, and we heat the sample from both sides. 
then after a short delay, which is typically 50 microseconds, um, we collect an X-ray spectrum and at the same time uh, we measure the temperature. So the, the um, emitted light from the hotspot, which I'm showing here, uh, is collected on the spectrometer and is fitted to uh, a Planck law, which allows us to measure the temperature. After one second, then we uh, switch off uh, the laser and we quench. Uh, and the measurement, measurement we collected was uh, like one point in this uh, pressure temperature phase diagram. Then uh, increasing the laser power, we can just uh, we perform a run in temperature and to each of these uh, points is associated a spectrum that can, then we can uh, analyze. Mm, we do the same on several pressures and this is how we build our phase diagram. And it's important to notice that um, uh, every time we heat on a portion of the sample, uh, we change the position so that in this way we can um, avoid as much as possible uh, chemical reactions. Uh, in some of the cases, we then uh, recover the, the samples, so we, we quench and uh, look at it um, uh, first optically. So we can see here uh, the sample before heating and the sample after heating. So we can uh, clearly identify the spots uh, where the laser uh, hit the sample. Uh, and we can also cut a section of this very small sample with the focused ion beam and look at the section uh, uh, with the scanning electron microscopy. And this is very useful for to perform uh, ex situ chemical analysis and to check what actually happened to the sample. And this uh, we will see soon. Okay. Um, so, but how can we determine if um, a sample is, uh, is actually molten? Sorry, I try to move. Okay. Um, so when we perform a run in uh, temperature, um, we can notice that there are some changes happening to uh, especially the exchange uh, part of the exhaust. Um, and uh, in particular, there is a sharp change which is happening at a certain temperature. What happens is that we lose this uh, shoulder and um, we can uh, we see that we, we have a flattening of these uh, first two oscillations. Uh, and this can actually be attributed to melting. And if we check all the um, materials we analyzed, uh, we actually see the same changes, uh, the same, uh, so the, this melting criterion is valid for all the uh, materials we analyzed. Here I'm showing the color code is in black. Uh, we have, uh, um, in all the cases, uh, the ambient temperature spectrum. Then the blue is normally a hot solid. And then we, the red is the liquid. Uh, so in all the cases, our melting criterion is a loss of features in the exchange. Uh, this can also be looked at uh, as um, a discontinuity in the T-scan. So the T-scan is, uh, um, I'm plotting here a T-scan, it's uh, uh, the value of the absorption uh, as a function of temperature at a specific uh, energy. So here we see that increasing the temperature, at some point we have a discontinuity, and this can also be associated to melting. Uh, and uh, for the first time, to our knowledge, we also try to validate this melting criterion. And we did this with uh, two techniques. Uh, first is ex situ. Uh, so as I was telling you just before, we cut the sample and we check at the, the section of the sample with the scanning electron microscopy. Uh, so here in lighter gray, we see the sample. Here was nickel embedded in the pressure transmitting medium. Uh, and in this case, so this is the quench of the hot solid, which we measured to be um, a hot solid. So here in the blue, we still have some features in the exchange. Um, we also cutted another sample where we actually reached a liquid, and this was uh, the associated exchange, which is featureless. Uh, and in, in that case, actually, the section, uh, the, the cut also shows uh, us that uh, we actually reached a liquid. Uh, so we can say that this is the uh, first validation of uh, our melting criterion. Mm, we also performed the calculations, ab initial molecular dynamics calculations. 
and this was a collaboration with the CEA uh, in Paris and uh, Keith Gilmore who was at the time was in the theory group of the ESRF. Uh, so we have uh, two different configurations, one is solid and one is liquid, in this case was cobalt. And Keith calculated the uh, density of states for these two configurations. And if we have a closer look at the uh, P density of states, we see in uh, um, solid line is, um, is the solid associated to the solid and the dashed line is the liquid. And in, in these three energy uh, ranges, which is exactly where we see the change between solid and liquid, uh, we see the disappearance of this feature in the P density of states. Um, but then also we used these, uh, these two configurations to calculate the exchange. And this is uh, the result for in blue uh, is the solid, and here in red is uh, this liquid configuration. And the change is we see between the two are actually the same changes we notice uh, experimentally. So this uh, we can say is a second uh, validation of this uh, melting criterion. Uh, but then we try to use uh, um, these calculations also to understand why, why do we lose the features. Mm. So here I'm showing um, there are several spectra which are calculated um, using each of this atom as an uh, absorber. And we see that each of uh, the atom, to each of the, these atoms is associated a spectrum which is uh, more or less similar to the one of the others. Uh, meaning that uh, all of them, they actually see the, the same atomic configurations um, around them. In the case of the liquid, each of them is, is still full of features, but these features are different between one and the other. So when then we average all of them, we get a featureless spectrum. So we can say um, that uh, this um, uh, loss of uh, features is actually associated to the appearance of multiple configurations in the liquid. Um, so this is our melting criterion and we applied it to, to several uh, materials. The first one I want to show you is uh, iron. Uh, so we, um, for, we measured again the melting curve of iron with uh, XAS. Uh, and this, in this case, we were very careful in comparing the spectrum of the quench to uh, the spectrum before heating. And we noticed that every time the two, so after and before and after heating, when, when we notice the same, uh, so no changes, then we got a high melting temperature. Uh, when the quench was not exactly um, equal, uh, super, the super was not exactly equal than uh, the one before heating, uh, then we got a low melting temperature. So here is represented with these uh, two points. So we can assume that the problem here for the iron phase diagram was not given by the inability of XAS to uh, probe melting, but can actually be attributed to the chemical reactions. And we identify these chemical reactions to be, chemical reaction to be with carbon. And actually we checked it also uh, with the ex situ analysis and uh, um, we, we mapped the samples with its ray diffraction. Uh, so we, we can say that uh, for this, uh, this um, discrepancy, a discrepancy between uh, XRD and XAS uh, is uh, solved. Um, then the other question we had uh, in the introduction was, it was if uh, the number of the electrons in uh, these 3D metals can influence the slope of the melting curve. Um, and in, uh, in our case, we measured the three uh, iron, uh, cobalt and nickel and we see no change in the slope of the melting curve for the three of them. So if we have a look at the phase diagram at 100 GPA, the melting temperature is always uh, 3,500 Kelvin within the error bar. Um, so we are in contradiction with this, uh, with this uh, paper of 2005. But not only the three these three uh, 3D metals show always the same uh, slope of melting curve, but also if we alloy, if we have an alloy of iron with nickel, and here we measure the 20%, 28% of nickel with iron, 
again, we get the same slope of the melting curve, meaning that nickel does not affect um, the, melting, the melting of iron. Um, so here I'm, I'm showing in, uh, in purple is the nickel, in blue is the iron, and pink is uh, this uh, iron nickel alloy. So the slope of the melting curve is not influenced, but the solid-solid phase transition, which for iron is here, for the iron nickel is actually here. And this was also super nice, uh, was super nice to detect this with, uh, with the XAS. Um, so we see that nickel does not influence the melting curve of iron, but if we have instead an alloy uh, with light elements, uh, so such as uh, carbon, sulfur, and oxygen. In this case, the, in this case, the melting curve can change a lot. Mm, and this is, um, so here I'm always showing the comparison between uh, pure iron, the, the black line, and, uh, um, and these, uh, these uh, four alloys. In the case of uh, iron silicon, actually we don't see much change. And this is the this is the first part. So if um, if somebody has any question, it's a great start. Thank you. Yes, we have several questions. Um, first, um, uh, you had the wonderful AIMD simulations. Yes. And uh, I'm going to ask the same question I try to ask everyone who shows that they've done uh, MD and and then taken the MD and, for example, done FEF calculations which is yeah. have you then taken that and done any machine learning methods to look for clustering or hidden information or correlations between structural features and spectral features? Yeah, the answer is not yet, but it, I, I'm actually supposed to do it. Not, not, really, not really machine learning, but uh, I was actually supposed, uh, supposed to um, study the correlations between uh, structure and uh, the calculations. And yeah. I started, uh, and then I stopped, and this is ongoing, but it's, <laughs> it's in some folder in my computer, but I'm not working on, on Very that. Very good. Okay. But uh, it's, um, if we get another confinement, I will probably work on that. <laughs> That's a good point. Okay, so Roberto, started, you have a question, I was actually, yes? Yeah. I think it's anyways, uh, uh, would be super interesting to see the, the result of this. <laughs> uh, Roberto, you have a question, Roberto Ruiz? Uh, you'll have to unmute Roberto. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Yang Ha, you have a question? Uh, yeah, so you talked a lot about the phase change at high temperature or high pressure. I was just wondering if uh, the Dubai water effect can also be observed on top of that through such a huge temperature range. Yeah, so of course we see that there is a, that there are changes due to the the, the bywater effect. I think uh, um, maybe it's not enough, but uh, we we this is what I have now. So here here, so the day by water actually um, we see it a lot in the exhausts, but uh, a bit also in the exhausts, but not uh, not all the time all the time. So sometimes uh, like here we can have. Uh, so this is not the, the best place, but, but we can have a change in the T-scan uh, where we notice a um, continuous change of, uh, of the, the, the absorption with temperature, and then still we see a sharp change for the, for the melting. Um, so if the question was, uh, uh, is, is uh, this loss of features only due to the by waller to, to the, the by waller or um, is a phase uh, change. I, I think it's a phase change because the day by waller affects, but it's not as sharp, it's continuous. I hope I answered, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I feel that those like a huge jump is due to a phase change. Yeah. Uh, when you do your like XF's fit, can you see the noise level increase with temperature? In, uh, in the, um, unfortunately, ah, no, here maybe. So yes, we see we see here that there is a um, day by waller effect in the dumping of the oscillations with temperature. So here, right, the of course, the by, the by waller has much weaker effects in the zanes than in the uh, uh, in the extended x-taps. 
Um, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of solid at high temperatures. This is, this is the only one uh, I have in this presentation, I think. Thanks. Matt Neuvel, you had a question? Yeah, so, so this is great stuff. Um, how are you distinguishing, what I'd like to know for right now is, how are you distinguishing between melt and glass? You say that the phase is melting, but the x-ray techniques are a snapshot that's, that are on the range of femtoseconds and they're sh short range order probes. So they don't really distinguish well, I think, between glass and melt. Yeah, are I, you I, distinguishing I, them and how? I'm, I, I'm not, but, uh, but I just assume that at, at a certain temperature, I get a melt and not a glass. Gotcha, okay, thanks. Awesome stuff. All right, great. Let's uh, let's move on to the next section of your talk then. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, okay, in this uh, second part of the presentation, I will talk to you about the uh, determination of um, compositional changes in binary alloys through uh, Xains. Uh, and this is quite uh, useful in the case of binary alloys because with laser heating, when we, when we heat them with laser heating, because when uh, we heat uh, locally, which is what happens with the laser, uh, we actually have a chemical migration, which is not, is not a reaction. But if we start, uh, for example, with uh, an FES uh, um, sample, we see that when we melt, uh, the melt has the composition of the eutectic. So here we can see in the, in the um, chemical map that we have an enrichment of sulfur in this uh, part, which is uh, the melt and uh, um, a depletion of some uh, sulfur uh, just close uh, to the part uh, where we heated. So it is, it is very important in uh, laser heating back experiments um, to check, always check uh, the composition of the sample um, after heating because it's not the same, composition will not be the same as the starting material. Um, so we, um, thanks to uh, the work we did in iron, where we realized that we could uh, uh, actually detect the chemical reactions in the Xanes, uh, we tried to adopt the same method, but to quantify, to quantify this time the amount of light uh, uh, element in the alloy. Uh, here I'm showing um, an example of uh, FeO, um, FeO, the, the excess of a Xanes of a FeO binary alloy. Uh, compared with the two end members. So in green, I have the pure iron, and in purple is uh, uh, the iron oxide, the stoichiometric iron oxide. And we see that the features of this black, uh, this black uh, stains is in between the one of the two end members. So we can perform um, a linear combination analysis and actually quantify the amount of uh, light elements in uh, this alloy. We did this for um, FeO and uh, the iron carbon alloy. Um, actually, in the iron carbon, we also have to consider that, uh, that uh, at certain uh, pressure temperature conditions, we have uh, um, carbon which goes in solution into uh, the solid iron. Uh, but applying this method, the linear combination analysis, we were able to um, actually quantify the amount of light element as a function of pressure. Mm. We compared these results uh, for the carbon and the oxygen with the literature. Uh, and we, we can see that we have a pretty, pretty good agreement. So in the case of carbon, we also performed the XC2 microprobe analysis on the recovered uh, samples. Um, and we see that the agreement is pretty good. In the case of iron oxide, unfortunately, we could not do a microprobe because the sample was lost. Um, uh, but we, we can compare with the literature and it is not bad. So um, we, for the first time, we applied uh, this uh, method of the linear combination analysis uh, to uh, our um, high pressure and high temperature binary alloys spectra, uh, proving that we can actually detect the um, composition of the eutectic. Mm, but then, uh, if every time we heat, uh, we, um, we measure, we quench and we measure the quench, uh, we can actually detect in situ 
after each heating, the composition uh, we reached with the, um, the, the composition, yeah, the change, of, we can track the change of composition while we increase the temperature. Um, here, we can see that we started with the starting, starting composition that is, uh, I think, 1.5% of carbon. Uh, while heating, we see that carbon goes in solid solution with iron because we, we don't see it anymore. And, uh, and then heating again, so increasing again the temperature, we reach the eutectic uh, point and we have the eutectic temperature and the eutectic composition. If we uh, overheat, then we see that the composition doesn't change anymore. Uh, so with, the, uh, with this uh, Xane's measurement, we can actually probe uh, the phase diagram as a function, the, the chemical phase diagram as a function of uh, pressure. And these uh, results of uh, melting curves and uh, analysis of decomposition can actually be used the, the, to, for a small uh, planetary implication. So this is an ongoing, ongoing work, um, still not finished, but uh, um, in the case of uh, Mars, so we know that uh, the center of Mars is uh, at about uh, a bit more than 40 GPA. Uh, we know that the core mantle boundary is uh, a bit more than 20 GPA. And we can plot in this phase diagram the uh, curve describing the um, mantle solidus. So if uh, the, the mantle is completely solid, then the, the temperature of the planet at this pressure has to stay below this curve. Um, then since we know that the Martian core is uh, um, partially, if not completely, molten, um, we, we, uh, we know that uh, its temperature, the temperature of the core, has to be higher than the melting temperature of uh, composing materials. Uh, these are the four melting curves of the eutectic compositions of these four binary alloys that we measured uh, in this work. Uh, and at the first, uh, first glance, we can say that uh, we, constrain, we can constrain the Martian core mantle boundary temperature to be in, uh, in this uh, temperature range. But actually, since we also know, uh, so we know that the eutectic composition and the eutectic temperature uh, with, the, for example, now we do the example of iron sulfur uh, is here. We know the melting temperature of iron, which is the end member here. And we can check several uh, models for the composition of Martian core. If we take uh, the first one with the 3.5% uh, weight percent of sulfur, it means that in the uh, chemical phase diagram we are here, meaning that the melting temperature of uh, this iron alloy with 3.5% of sulfur would be uh, 2,120 Kelvin. Uh, and so if we want a liquid core made of 3.5% of sulfur, it means that the temperature will be higher than this value and lower than this value. Um, so with this exercise, we can actually uh, keep constraining the, the temperature of, um, of Martian core. Uh, this, is, this is, of course, not finished yet. It's just, uh, now it's just a nice, um, a funny, um, funny game. But if uh, we can compare with the temperature calculations uh, by in this paper, so she does uh, planetary modeling, and um, maybe, maybe we're not this far. So I can stop here for the second part. Okay, very good. Um, uh, there's one question, it's a little bit of an aside, but of course there's the big news about room temperature superconductivity. Uh, uh, exactly, yes. <laughs> using, exactly using diamond anvil cells and laser heating. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about uh, the use of synchrotrons uh, to try and diagnose what is that material? Um, and, and how to help the synchrotron could help make more progress in that field. I think it's the, it's the only way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually, I haven't read the paper yet. <laughs> good, good. Okay. All right. You should continue with the third part of your talk, please. Hmm. Okay. So in the, the uh, third part, uh, I will talk to you about the determination of liquid uh, structure uh, with the um, uh, X subset high pressure. Uh, but first, a small introduction on liquids. Uh, so we know that the structure of a liquid is in between the structure of a crystalline solid and the one of a gas. 
so the crystal crystalline solid is characterized by fixed uh, atomic positions and a long range order. If instead we look at the gas, we have uh, random atomic uh, random atomic positions. Uh, the liquid or anamorphous solid is exactly in between, so we, we have a short range ordering and the structure of a liquid can be described with the radial distribution function, um, which is actually the probability of finding an atom in a position R uh, with respect to an origin, uh, origin atom. Mm, and this first peak in the radial distribution function uh, tells us the distance, the first neighboring distance. Uh, then in, uh, we, we can also like, integrate uh, this first peak and get the uh, coordination number, so we can, uh, structural, um, we can get other structural information. Um, okay, and uh, again, the uh, um, difference between solid and liquid, I really like uh, this, uh, this image, where we can see that actually in a solid, uh, we have uh, thermal oscillations of atoms around the fixed uh, atomic positions, while uh, in a liquid, the atoms can actually uh, wander around. Um, but when it comes to uh, exaps, how do we analyze uh, the exaps of a liquid? So we, we know that in the case of a crystalline solid at low temperature, the Gaussian shell uh, model is valid and we have this uh, classical uh, exaps uh, formulation. Uh, already when we higher the temperature, it would be better uh, to use a cumulant expansion where we can actually um, take into account the asymmetry of the potential. Uh, in the case of the liquid, where we have a, a huge uh, uh, configurational disorder, um, we can use this formulation and uh, actually in this work we use the program written by uh, Philip Pony, which is called uh, GenXAS. So in this formulation we see that if we have a structure information, so the, if we know the radial distribution function, calculating the XF signal uh, is, uh, is easy. Mm, but the opposite is actually not valid. So to perform uh, the analysis of uh, a liquid, we start with the model radial distribution function, which can come uh, from calculations or X-ray diffraction or other techniques. Uh, we calculate uh, an XR signal associated to this structure and we fit it to uh, our data. The result of the fit will give, a, will give us a real uh, radial distribution function associated to our data. Uh, so this is how the spectrum of a liquid, the XR of a liquid looks like. So we see it's quite uh, tricky uh, to get a signal out of that. Um, and also I need to say that while we heat uh, with, with the laser heating, very often the shape of uh, the sample changes a bit and this ru can ruin uh, the, the background. Uh, and that's the reason why of all, all of the um, spectra we measured, um, just some of them can be kept for the analysis to give a reliable result. Um, so here I show you the, uh, the fit, uh, the fits, several fits for the nickel and the cobalt. So we are along, these are liquids along the melting curve at uh, different pressures. And we can see that at increasing pressure in both cases, uh, we have a shift of the oscillations to the right, which is compatible with the uh, compression of the system. Um, and if we have a closer, closer look at this data, we see that there is one of them is at, uh, at one bar, so it is taken at ambient conditions, and uh, it exhibits uh, a much uh, higher noise than the others. And this was actually uh, taken in a different way than the others. So this was not uh, measured into a diamond and cell, but we actually put a foil uh, in air, fluxed it uh, with, uh, with nitrogen to avoid chemical reactions. Uh, and we heat it with the laser and measure very fast uh, exhaust. Uh, here was uh, like 200 uh, microsecond uh, exhaust, the, 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 uh, explaining why we have a higher noise. But uh, I think it is quite nice because it's always, um, it's always difficult to have um, comparable uh, spectra for the high pressure and the, uh, non, uh, the um, ambient pressure one. In this case, of course, we could not measure the melting temperature, uh, but we took the first uh, melting we, we obtained and uh, the melting temperature of these materials at ambient pressure is actually, actually is known. 
Um, so to each of these uh, fits is associated a, a radial distribution function. And if we take the uh, maximum value of the, the first peak of the radial distribution function, uh, we have um, the, um, the variation of the first neighboring distance as a function of uh, pressure. Here is shown with the, with the blue and the green uh, dots. The experimental data are the dots. And we can actually compare with the literature where we found only calculations. Um, and we see that the agreement, we have a quite a good agreement with the trend, not the absolute value, but the trend of um, this calculation. And uh, the agreement is, is uh, less good with these calculations by uh, Lee for in the nickel case. And actually, if we look at where these, uh, these points were, were calculated, we see that the high the pressure and temperature conditions um, of our experiments are closer to the ones of uh, cow, while Li uh, has something which is at a constant uh, temperature. So this might explain this uh, this small discrepancy. The same uh, the same thing. So this uh, the, the difference in the slope of uh, the compression. Uh, can be seen in cobalt where these are actually our, our calculations. Um, so exploiting the proportionality between um, uh, at interatomic distances and the volume, uh, we try to calculate the volume and exploiting the equations of states, uh, we corrected uh, the, the temperature factor, um, so the, the contribution of the temperature. Here, so I'm showing the, an evaluation of the volume rescaled at 3000 Kelvin for, uh, the three, for the three of them. And in that case, uh, the um, agreement within, within, uh, between uh, experiment and uh, calculations uh, is actually much better. Um, okay, so with this, uh, with this I conclude, I can uh, jump to the conclusions, mm, general conclusions. So, uh, the, the first question we wanted to address was if uh, uh, XAS is a suitable technique to probe melting and uh, why. Um, we showed that it is, we also validated the criterion um, with ex situ analysis and uh, with calculations. We also showed that, that uh, our melting criterion, the melting criterion is justified by um, uh, the appearance, appearance of uh, multiple configurations in, uh, in uh, the liquid. We use this criterion to um, probe again the phase diagram of iron uh, and uh, we exploited the same properties to uh, solve these controversies, uh, to solve this, uh, yeah, this debate. Um, we did not see any link between the number of uh, 3D uh, of the electrons in the 3D metals and the slope of the melting curves, as well as we didn't we see no change in the slope of the melting curve of iron when alloyed with uh, nickel, while uh, it changes a lot when we alloy it with light elements. In this work, we also were able to um, detect. Uh, chemical uh, to quantify the um, composition of binary iron binary alloys with uh, light elements uh, and used it uh, and we are using it uh, to get some insight into planetary interiors. Uh, actually this, um, this um, determination of the composition with the xanes can also be useful in the future if uh, we will be able to perform uh, pulsed laser heating experiments uh, because it will, so we will try to um, melt the starting composition, meaning that if, if we uh, can heat for a very short uh, time, then maybe we can melt before the chemical migration occurs and we can actually check what we're doing with, uh, with the xanes, which is uh, super useful and super nice. Um, then we can use the X for the first time. We could use uh, XF to XF to probe the interatomic distances in uh, liquids under pressure. Um, so we got the compression of uh, nickel and cobalt. So this uh, this analysis was was quite hard, 
um, especially because of um, the short uh, extras we, we had in, uh, with this data. Uh, actually, with the EBS, so with the extremely brilliant uh, source uh, upgrade of um, the SRF, it will be possible to have a smaller beam on the sample, meaning that we, be, we will be less sensitive to the background and uh, probably a longer range because uh, ID24, one part, so one of the two arches of ID24 will become scanning with a monochromator. Uh, which will, in principle, allow um, to get a, a longer access still in one second. Um, that maybe will allow us to have a longer spectra and then uh, it will be also possible to um, uh, get the compression not only of nickel and cobalt, but also of more complicated systems like uh, the iron alloys, uh, which have a, a quite a huge geophysical interest. Um, before I conclude, I would like to acknowledge um, the people that um, participated to this work. So what I'm showing, uh, what I showed today is the result of uh, uh, many experiments uh, and uh, it's actually uh, most of the things are already published in many papers and, and uh, many people were involved. So thank to them and thank you for your attention. Thank you. That was uh, that was terrific. Um, uh, to, to begin, uh, Matt Nouvel, you have a question. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so awesome stuff, Salim. That, that was great. Um, yeah, my question, and you sort of addressed this maybe in the in your conclusions uh, on the second part, where you were doing the melting curves of the binary alloys, the iron sulfur and the iron oxide. You showed a, an image of the of the chemical composition, um, and I'm wondering if you could with that, could you see X solution? That is the migration of minority phases or, or some of the phases, the separation as you're across the melting curve in either, in either direction away from the eutectic. So, so I think uh, you, you, you mean this, uh, in this. Um... Well, as you, so as you, cross the, as you cross the melting curve, right, you expect the phases to separate. And, and so you could see more or less carbon or more or less sulfur in different locations. And so it's a, my question is, can you see that? Like, is there enough transport or enough time for that transport to happen um, in these short melting experiments? So in, in this melting experiment, when I melt, I reach, so let, let's say I started with this starting composition. Mm -hmm. As soon yeah. as I reach the, the temperature of the eutectic, I get the composition of the eutectic, and then if I keep uh, heating on the same spot, I I I will just uh, keep uh, keep the same uh, the same uh, composition well, here. Well, you you'll you'll get the eutectic composition, but you'll also yes. but, but the remaining the remaining atoms will go into someplace else, and that won't yeah, be so, at the eutectic. So like, right? so yeah. So you mean here? So here, here we probe the eutectic, and you're meaning here we have a, a different composition. This is what you mean. Yeah, I guess. It, like, so in that sulfur map, in that map of sulfur, are you able to quantify that well enough to see the X solution in this? You know, because that would be interesting too to watch that X solution happen. We with the beam, uh, we we had uh, up to now was not possible because, uh, as you can see here, this is two microns. Mm -hmm. So this is less than two microns, and our beam here was uh, five microns little, halfway down. A little big, right? So, so just big enough to, uh, I mean, small enough uh, to analyze the melt, but not small enough uh, to analyze the chemical part uh, here. This uh, chemical uh, change uh, here. I wonder, maybe it will be possible after the upgrade. Um, if the beam, uh, with the beam, uh, I mean the, the upgrade is already finished, but now it's still not possible to to do um, laser heating experiments on the beam line because they're refurbishing uh, the, I mean they have to rebuild everything. Uh, maybe with one micron beam, it will be possible. Okay, actually, a separate actually question. would can be you, it would be very nice. Can, to, to map, that would be really interesting. As, as a separate question, can you give us a status update on that beam line? Uh, post up uh, ESRF upgrade. What is what's the status of that? 
so I, I, I don't work there anymore, but I was talking to, uh, to the people uh, recently, so may, maybe the information I will give you will not be perfect because it's, uh, it's out of uh, chit chat. <laughs> uh -huh. But um, uh, so the idea is uh, that they will keep one part will, uh, will uh, still be, uh, is going to still be um, energy dispersive and this will be the part dedicated to the dynamic compression. Um, so they will, uh, they will, uh, they have, uh, they recently bought a super huge laser that will uh, allow them to do shock compression and then uh, with this uh, energy dispersive they will be able to um, probe the exchange. The other arch uh, will become uh, scanning with a fast monochromator uh, and in this arch uh, they plan to, they plan to refurbish the, the laser eating system um, and actually their idea, idea is to have uh, something which also allows to have, uh, to have uh, some uh, diffraction and uh, fluorescence uh, measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, not, uh, I, I, uh, this is not operational yet. I think it will take uh, at least uh, one year. Okay. Yeah, but I can, uh, you, uh, I can um, um, put in contact with the people of the team and if you want, if you want more precise uh, answers. Yeah, actually, that'd be, that'd be, I would like that. That would be wonderful to know. So yes, I guess I could ask them myself then. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can give you, I can uh, give you their emails. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, a last question. Uh, did I understand correctly that as part of the upgrade, you won't be using the dispersive anymore, but instead you'll have a, a fast scanning monochromator. Is that right? Yeah, for, for the laser eating experiments, yes, and should be fast enough that it will be possible to collect the longer uh, exhausts, uh, uh -huh. but still in one second. Because uh, the, the, in this work we were, for example, for the iron case, we were really happy to be able to get a decent uh, uh, spectrum as short as one second, because in this way we can uh, um, limit as much as possible the chemical uh, reactions. Mm. So the idea, yes, is to keep, uh, to keep this one second uh, heating. I see, I see. Um, uh, uh, is there any uh, consideration of, uh, of adding diffraction to this setup? Yeah, um, the, the, plan, uh, the plan for this setup, this laser eating setup is uh, also to add, uh, to add the uh, diffraction detector. And uh, if, I, if I'm not, uh, if I'm correct, uh, I think with the new with this new monochromator will be easier to pass uh, by from a low low um, like uh, from seven the seven K, K A V uh, that are necessary for the iron to a higher energy that will allow to have a, a, a decent diffraction I mean a decent uh, uh, angle dispersive uh, diffraction. Right. Right. So I, right. I I think it will be quite fast to go from one to the other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this will allow to do both. Very good. We have a, a last question from Emin. Uh, Emin, uh, can you unmute your mic? Hello. Hello, Silvia. Hey. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, if I understood uh, correctly, when you discussed about the, the melting behavior of uh, mixed uh, iron and the nickel uh, or iron and the cobalt, uh, you have mentioned that uh, in some cases, the, the melting, point, uh, melting points did not change. And uh, is it normal in, in your opinion? Because uh, the melting points of the eutectic uh, alloys should be less than the, the melting points of the Bose uh, melting yeah, points okay. of so, pure elements. Yeah, so in, uh, in, uh, here I was just uh, showing the pure, but it's true that here is an alloy uh, with, uh, with nickel. And uh, actually, I think uh, that the chemical uh, iron nickel uh, phase diagram has uh, an eutectic which is uh, which is very close uh, to to the temperature uh, of uh, the the two end members. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I think it's quite normal. While uh, while in the case of uh, the the um, in the case of the alloys with the light elements, that then here yes, we have an eutectic which has a temperature which is much lower, much lower than the end members. 
Okay, but there so are good. there are some evaluation in the literature. Uh, th there are some evaluation of uh, of the chemical uh, phase diagram of iron and nickel. So iron and nickel with them as the members, uh, okay. and actually it seems uh, that the eutectic is not uh, is not uh, lower. So it's, uh, in, in the in the pressures uh, analyzed, it doesn't change so much. Okay, thank you, thank you.